We got Gators Breakdown here. We know we're business. Gators Breakdown. Because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. The Gators Breakdown Podcast is ready to go. I am your host, David Waters. You can find me on social media at GatorDave underscore SEC. Coming at you, a little bye week action with the guys from Gators Game Day, Seth and Bud Davis right here joining us on Gators Breakdown. And guys, thanks. Um, we, we had talked about this during one of the bye weeks we would get together and I think we picked the right bye week to get together because of uh, everything that's kind of changed for Florida the last three weeks at the quarterback spot. What we've seen from a better defense the last three weeks since the last bye week. So, guys, thank you. Thank you so much for hopping on here. Yeah, thanks for having us on. Yeah, Dave, great to be here. Good to chat with you. Yeah, so everybody out there, um, after this video episode, however you wanted to find it out there, go search up Gators Game Day on YouTube, subscribe, Watch those guys and, and, and the good work they've done. I'm going to I'm going to read the synopsis, but you guys can dive into it for dive into a little bit more for a second. But a look at the Gators team from a film and analytics perspective from the host Jay Bud Davis and Seth Barnador. So, guys, anything else you want to throw out there? How many times a week? How many episodes can uh, guys expect? Because believe me, um, I, I I know. I don't get too far in the weeds with the with, with the film because, first of all, I'm not qualified to do so. So, but uh, that doesn't seem to stop everybody. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Seth, I know you, you've been you've been on Gators Breakdown many a times, and but definitely glad to have you on uh, to to give. I mean, I know I share your Twitter stuff all the time. I know you both of you guys are in the Gators Breakdown Plus Discord, so so thanks for that as well. But uh, anything else you want everybody out there to know about Gators Game Day? Yeah, we usually. Uh are live on like game week Thursdays. Thursday nights is typically the night where we, we kind of preview the upcoming game, review the last one. And then we are trying to, for most of the games, we've been able to kind of go a halftime show and a post game show with video, with kind of live updated advanced stats um, and kind of talk through the game at that point and kind of maybe show where some scheme stuff is working or not working. And then Bud can kind of, take us behind the numbers a little bit and explain maybe where some positive or negative regression may be coming from. So, yeah, it's been fun. I mean, it's also been tough. I mean, if you go to games, it's hard to, to connect. Yeah. We've tried it from the stadium. I thought that was actually pretty fun. Um, that was UCF game. Um, done a little bit of post game, especially uh, either good or bad. Try and knock it out. Um, I think we had really might have been having too much of a heartbreak after the Tennessee game, but <laughs> sometimes it's good to commiserate. Um, yeah. So it's been fun. I mean, we're kind of figuring it out. Um, you know, hopefully we'll get more structure with it as we go. But right now I think we're just kind of filling out our rhythm. And, you know, Seth's got a great film background, can actually watch this stuff and so quickly tell you what's going on. Um, I can pull the numbers and get the data. I think getting able to, being able to marry those two to, to match the eye test, especially from a big picture scheme perspective with the actual data, yeah. see what strategies are working, test different ideas. It's been fun. Yeah. Uh, I've checked it out and it, and I, from my own perspective, it's a lot easier during away games. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm all over the place with home games too. Cause I, yeah. I'm in Gainesville and it's like, oh, if I can make it home in time, I'll try and record, but if not, I'll wait till Sunday. And so, yeah, I, I completely understand, but you, you got some structure on away games because you know, uh, you don't, you don't, there's, no, there's no travel involved and uh, you got good signal in your house besides trying to rely on the cell phone signal at the stadium. So uh, yeah. plenty to get into. We will get into a lot of the weeds here with the, with the guys. We'll go into the offensive scheme and kind of a lot of the questions that you guys have, you know, we're going to dive into here as well but also that improved defense from the last three weeks so guys let's just dive straight into it um i think where a lot of people would love to start of course is at the quarterback spot Graham Mertz goes down it is dj lagways time to shine as the gators quarterback and boy did he shine against kentucky last week and obviously going down the field more with, with lagway but what other wrinkles maybe even tendency breakers did you notice that maybe we didn't see with Mertz and on the along some of the line, what was it more of the same? Yeah, this kind of in our preseason, we kind of we did a whole show on the Florida's downfield passing game because it kind of disappeared last year. Uh, with Anthony Richardson, they threw the ball downfield a ton, uh, but last year it was totally gone, and that was kind of one of the biggest changes from uh, 
the previous season to last season. And so we kind of wanted to see, is this a Graham Mertz issue? Is this, you know, was the AR season an aberration? And so we found that, like, schematically, Napier wants to throw the ball down the field. Mertz was a little bit more hesitant, and I think you kind of were hoping that it was an offensive line issue last year. Uh, but it does seem like he's not he was not willing to take some of the chances that DJ Lagway is willing to take. Um, I think that gives you a higher ceiling, but also probably lowers your floor a little bit uh, with, with some of the turnovers. But when you hit those shots, it can really help loosen up the defense. And it's something that was sorely missing in that Miami game where you dialed up some pretty good shots and had guys open and you couldn't hit them. Yeah, I think we were hoping to see Graham in year two push the ball down the field. I think I'd kind of convinced myself, you know, looking at Graham's Wisconsin numbers that he had a tendency to be pretty cautious and not throw down the field in his first years. And he was pretty big outlier from Napier QBs in terms of not being willing to throw the ball down the field. So I was like, all right, maybe this is just first year in the system. He's taking the safe passes. Napier kind of talked about that in, in some of his clinics that they wanted him to be a little bit smarter um, with where he went with the ball. And, you know, Mertz is pretty smart with the ball, but at the same time, he, he probably doesn't take enough risks and we didn't see him push the ball down the field like he needed to for this offense, which, you know, the offense is really designed to make big explosive passing plays. It's not very good at efficient pass at concepts. I think Seth and I have talked about this a few times. This is That's where the offense really kind of struggles. But the big shots, the offense is good. It sets them up. There's a lot of them. And Mertz probably just isn't quite as good at pulling the trigger on those. And then we saw TJ Lagway. You know, he's pulling the trigger every chance he gets. Um, and really going with, you know, the high part of his read, he is making that a priority. There's probably a couple passes where – it's like, man, I, I'm surprised he didn't take this, you know, lower down guy. He's really pushing it. Um, so it's good to see. I think it's risky. Um, reminds me a little bit of Anthony Richardson, but I do think we have way better receiving weapons than we did when Anthony Richardson was here. You know, we have three true good wide receivers and a good receiving tight end. So you got four receiving weapons. The O-line is significantly better. Our running backs are playing well. Um, so I think there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic on offense right now. Yeah, kind of on that on that note, you you compared him to Anthony Richardson, and look, at least we now get him. Look, there's no previous head coach that he had to now maybe you know unlearn and now learn a Billy Napier offense. He's been ingrained in it. I mean, he was working on this offense in high school. You know, they were training that they were doing behind the scenes. He was. You know, training with the University of Florida football, he was he he was getting ingrained in the offense while he was still in high school. Um, so, Seth, maybe maybe more for you here. What should we be looking for with Lagway as far as growth and maturity uh, in the offense? Now, you know, Anthony Richardson's a good comp, and we we I, I'd love to have that as a baseline uh, for where DJ Lagway's starting, but. Being in this offense, being ingrained, and if we're going to look forward, you know, what should we be looking for as far as a better quarterback, whether it be the rest of this year, but also looking forward ahead? Yeah, and I think like just as a natural throw, I think Lagway's a kind of for a lot further along than Richardson was at this point, uh, and I think he's probably a better natural thrower. I think kind of like Bud mentioned the the more efficient passing game, like you do not want to be, and this is, was in that that Richardson year. Offense was very boomer bust, very dependent on explosive plays, pretty low success rate, not super efficient. And you saw that can only take you so far. And then last year, we kind of saw the inverse, not very explosive, but a lot more efficient was Graham Mertz. You kind of, to, to be really elite, you need to be able to mix those and kind of have, be able to get the explosive <laughs> plays and be and, efficient. And I'm, glad you, and I'm glad you said that because we all remember the conversations when Richardson left and Mertz came in. Oh, all we got to do is be consistent. All we got to – no, that wasn't really the – They were a lot there. more consistent <laughs> last year. Yeah, the success rate was pretty good last year. But, yeah, it's yeah. not – you've got in – really, the, every time you generate an explosive play, your chance of scoring goes way up. Um, so the, those are very important. But if – I mean, we all saw it with Richardson. He'd hit a bomb, and then you come back and throw a couple in the dirt, and now you're three and out. 
it kind of evens out and does in, in a poor way. So I think for Lagway, just the, the efficiency and not turning the football over. I mean, those are two things that as a young guy, I think a lot of young guys struggle with, but that's kind of where I think he really needs to make improvement. And I feel like we've seen kind of some improvement from him since he's been here. I mean, you hear he's not like the most unbelievable practice player and all this and that, but he comes out and plays and he plays pretty well. So I, I think he'll, you'll see that hopefully as the year goes on. How much do you try to rein in a gunslinger mentality though? Yeah. Cause that's who he, if that's who he is and he's going to take those chances, how, how do you, as a coach, how do you adapt to that, that gunslinger who's going to take the chances and that's why he's going to be so good, but that's also what's going to cost him. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you just got to, understand okay maybe maybe we if if you don't want him to take the chances don't call the play <laughs> like you know like the the interception he threw uh against tennessee like he tries to fit it over the top of the guy you know maybe if they don't call it into the boundary maybe if they call it to the field he can fit it over the top of the guy because you got some more room uh but it's still the the wrong read he should have just dropped it down so I, I think that's kind of making sure he's not you know just sticking on that first read he's kind of moving through the progression and I think they do a really good job coaching the quarterbacks that we talked about in the off season. They have, it's so detailed and you mentioned it. They've been working with Lagway since he was a senior in high school, like on, on their quarterback progression plan. So I would imagine it'd get better, but I, I don't think you want to limit his aggressiveness because I think like, but so that really makes the offense go when you can hit those vertical shots. But uh, you can add something to that, but I also want to pull kind of up, lucky uh, in a way. Yeah. You know, we talked about this a little bit, Yeah, yeah. So I was just going to say, we're kind of lucky. You know, we talked about this. How are we going to use Lagway this season? Was he going to have kind of his own special package or was he going to run the offense? And, you know, just like Mertz did. And we essentially see Lagway running an almost identical, you know, offense to what Mertz ran. A little, I think we saw some wrinkles versus Kentucky, but in general, it, it really looked like the same stuff. And people have been getting frustrated with that. And I kind of get it. It wasn't, it wasn't the same as like Leak Tebow. But it is good as we head into Lagway being QB1 and running this offense. You know, the play sheet's going to stay pretty close to the same. Um, and really, the wrinkles we're adding, I thought they were really effective versus Kentucky, um, especially how we used the zone read. You know, I thought it was some of Napier's best situational play calling. Kentucky really asked Florida to, to beat them with the tough throws. You know, they took away the short throws and they asked Legway to beat him over the top, and he did. Um, and and I thought, you know, that was a good game plan and really well executed by him. So I'm pretty – I'm getting more and more optimistic going forward. Bud, you shared this, and uh, I know it's been a popular topic here of, you know, the, the personnel Florida uses and how to change it. Does it need to be changed? And um, – we had a Gators Breakdown Plus chat this week. We've seen it all over social media as well. And there's the narrative of let's open now that Lagway's in, let's open up the offense more. And as you said, it might be more the same of what we've seen from Mertz, and it might just be Lagway himself opening it up. But from the coaching perspective, for both of you guys as well, you can share numbers here for, for, from what Bud Davis shared this week of, you know, the personnel that's out there, you know, the the 12 personnel, or should, should Florida open it up and go with more four or five receiver sets? With Lagway at quarterback, you know, do we see, do we eventually see a shift into four or five receiver sets? Because, look, a, a, as we know, it is in the offense for it to go deep, but it might be one or two routes that go deep. It's not four or five wide, and you're sending four verts a whole lot in, in, in this offense. So do we expect – as Lagway gets more comfortable, as we see these receivers get more comfortable with him and keep showcasing their talents, do we see maybe a shift somewhere down the line of opening up the offense a bit more as far as personnel goes? Yeah, I don't I don't know. I don't there's not really it's kind of turned, you know, the last few years where the best offenses in college football are not in 10 personnel. They're not playing four receivers at the time. You play most of the best offenses in college football are in 11. They play three receivers and a tight end that's that can do a variety of things. Um, I would imagine that's going to stay their base. And then why you don't see as much 10, I think, and why you're starting to see a lot more 12 is that linebackers have gotten a lot smaller and faster. Nickel personnel has become a lot more prevalent. So you can punish some people by going bigger. 
and you see four to success rate and EPA per play when they are in big personnel, that 12 personnel grouping, it's really good. So I, I wouldn't imagine you see a ton of 10. You might see a little here and there because you do have some receivers that have stepped up mm -hmm. outside of kind of the two or three you, you felt pretty good in going into the year. So maybe you see a little bit of it. Uh, but, you know, I think they like the flexibility that 11 gives them, especially if you feel like a guy like Arliss Boardingham can flex out and play receiver. Hayden Hansen's had a really good year. So if you feel like you can move one of those guys around, it gives you so much more flexibility. Uh, but, um, you know, I, you could maybe see it, but I, I don't, I would, I would be kind of surprised if we saw anything other than 11 and 12. Same. I think yeah. if, if, we, if Napier had a 10, you know, scheme in his playbook, we would have seen it sometime in the past three years. Yeah, I think that's where a lot of people go with um, what is the, um, you know, you bring in Russ Callaway, and, of course, he's got their spread concepts and maybe spreading teams out. And, and, and Seth, I know in the offseason we had a big episode about that uh, when, when we talked Callaway and what his impact could be. Um, a lot of people will point to that as, well, he's got that background. Why don't we let him open it up a bit more with, with, with this offense? But it certainly seems like what has been successful so far this season with, with, with Florida, you know, granted, you know, it's been limited stats with lag weight, and we're starting to see more and more and more. Uh, but as you guys say, I, especially knowing Napier's reputation as well, he's not going to stray too far away from <laughs> what he's comfortable with. And, and look, maybe, maybe that's a detriment to him when it's all said and done. But at the same time, you can at least point to something in some data that shows, hey, that it, it's working to an extent. Like I, I think well, the interesting part is if you look at all the names that everybody would like, you know, if if slash win Napier gets fired, all the names everybody would like to come in here that are offensive gurus are all in eleven and twelve personnel. None of them are in four wide receiver stuff often. Now you may like a guy like Lincoln Riley might get in a little bit. For the most part, it's eleven and twelve. So that's just uh, that's kind of where it has it, it's at cyclically right now. Uh, so it will, <laughs> the personnel I don't think would change too much, uh, regardless of who the coach is right now calling plays, but maybe a little bit. Uh, one angle, guys, that has been pretty popular, and for me, it's an observation, not a complaint. But the polarizing Trey Wilson, of course, has been out uh, a little bit this year, been injured. Um, Thankfully, you know, we got some other receivers stepping up, but we see Badger. We see DK making play plays down the field on a on a more consistent basis. And I remember going back and bringing those guys in, the thought being those guys can open up the offense to get Trey Wilson some more touches. You know, with what they have shown so far, that possibility is there now. Uh, defenses definitely need a game plan for those two. But what about Wilson? You know, how does he get involved more? Um, yes, he had that deep completion versus Kentucky, but nothing else in the game. Uh, is this a product of him being more of a gadget receiver and most plays are designed closer to the line of scrimmage? Yeah, I personally think, you know, we need to see more before really knowing uh, of him playing with Lagway as well and maybe how that game adapts to him. Uh, but, I mean, you've seen, you know, Badger definitely leads the country right now in yards per catch. Uh, DK is, I don't know how many times they're going to run that crosser and nobody stops it. Uh, it seems it seems every game we're going we're, we're going to see that pass uh, and then Trey Wilson you know like I said the one catch versus Kentucky we haven't seen a whole lot uh, as far as you know compared to those two I thought it would open up more balls for Trey Wilson and maybe is he I don't even know if he's 100 percent you know he's coming yeah. back from injury a bit as well maybe that plays into it but what do you guys think about the use so far of Trey Wilson and then maybe even comparing it to the the other guys that are really showing out so far. I'll let Bud go first I think, here. You know, yeah, I think people are probably have too high expectations for Trey. Trey's having a good season. You know, he doesn't have to be our only receiver. Um, you know, you look at his numbers. I like to look at yards per route ran. Um, you know, being above two is good. And we got Trey at 2.8. We got DK at 2.9. And Elijah Badger's at 3.8 six which is crazy you know that's three receivers that are you know well above a metric that would be hey that's a that's a really good receiver we got three guys who are producing yeah here, here it is right here um you know 
Wilson's got fewer targets. He's played in fewer games. But, you know, outside of the Kentucky game, he's had pretty good usage. He's not getting targeted, you know, nearly down the field as those guys. Some of that's the pop passes. Some of that's the throws to the flat. But, you know, we can we can look at um, – I think we got the route trees, c- courtesy of Huddle IQ. If you can pull those up. Yeah, so here it is, 23-24. And, you know, we're pushing him down the field more this year. So the thickness of the white lines are how often the route gets run. And then the uh, the colors of the little circles are how often um, they're getting targeted. So you could see, you know, last year he's really running shallow routes. He's got the slant. We saw a lot of Trey Wilson slant last year. Um, he had the go route and he had a curl route. But this year we're seeing, you know, the full – six, seven, eight, nine, you know, on the, on the route tree, you know, we've got the digs, we've got the ends. Um, we're seeing a lot more vertical routes from him, which is probably just his maturity as a, as a route runner and as a receiver. I think it's what people's asked for, but he's just not ha- being asked to be the only guy out there. Um, it's not just him and Pearsall. We've got another dude, either Badger. We had, we now have three receivers who are eating versus two. So, um, you know, the numbers have changed a little bit, but he's also just not run as many routes um, as last year. But he's still he's still having a good year. Yeah, I guess the, the number that speak the, the number that shows out the most for me is I guess maybe first down percentage going into that graph that you know I, I, I shared just a second ago. First down percentage, Badger, 90.9. That's ridiculous. Uh, DK, 71.4. And then you get that drop to Trey Wilson. And as like I said, you know, maybe maybe the routes are being run deep, but he's just not getting the ball down the field as much as those guys. Well, yeah, he's also like – Hanson, 70. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hanson's been pretty good. Hanson, Hanson's 78. Wow. Yeah, it's all. I think it's also takes an effect, right? All the every time they pop pass to him, that's that that mm-hmm. that goes to the depth of targets, so that takes it down. And he's yeah. also been. You see that he's been a lot. Well, last year is a lot more kind of a flat as like an outlet. This year they've been trying to get him screen passes, and they've been just they're just not a very good screen team. No, uh, they've been close on a couple, but you see the screen lines a lot thicker this year. So they're trying to make a concerted effort to get him the ball in space. Um, but, you know, I, I'm interested to see as he gets more healthy or, or or if you feel like he is getting healthier. I don't know if he's 100% or not, how his usage evolves. Because you do have a guy in Badger that seems like he can take the top off. And now that's a lot of room to operate underneath that. And yeah. I thought they did a really good job. Um, that first, uh, I think it was the first third down throw on the, on the drive, the 40-yarder he caught against Kentucky – was a really nice change up. It's, it was a different way for them to run flood and they brought him Kentucky's really good at keeping stuff in front of them. So instead of asking him just run by a guy, they put two in front of the, they put two in front of safeties and corners opposite the field. As soon as they saw those guys stop, they kind of pinned down on it. And now here comes Wilson from the opposite side, getting over the top. So I, I think there's, ways to use him and i think they're going to ex- try to explore more especially now that you've got a guy that can you feel can get vertical and badger and then dk is doing a pretty good job underneath and being a really good run after the catch guy so maybe he can take on some of those flat routes and outlets and things like that and let wilson really work in that intermediate space guys i talked about it earlier this week with will uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pull up just their their stats but but badger leading the country <laughs> in yards per catch I didn't think we were getting that type of receiver uh, from Arizona State. Everybody knows how I was I was high on getting Elijah Badger, but it was more I right, catch a catch a five yard, break a tackle, and then run forty yards. I didn't expect catching balls forty yards down the field as much as we have seen, and he's blowing it out of the water. I mean, <laughs> last year he averaged you know eleven yards per reception. The year before twelve point four. He's pretty much doubled his top output. <laughs> from from a couple of years ago, uh, I mean, though, of course, these are just basic stats. But just wanted to see and compare what the, what these guys were doing, him and DK both, what they were doing before Florida, and now what and what they're doing now. They're blowing their best seasons that they had before out of the water here at Florida. Yeah, I think these were both really good evaluations, right? And that's something you hear about now. Maybe yeah, there's some are- other there's other positions in the transfer portal that aren't 
haven't been quite as good at evaluations. Uh, maybe not too bad, but uh, but these guys seem to be. Badger was a guy that had a lot of kind of hype around him, so that one you know, maybe you don't give as much credit for. But the DK one was you see his numbers. He had a good year with Mertz in twenty two, but mm-hmm. nothing that would say this guy is you know an unbelievable playmaker. I think he was a track guy, so he does have some verified speed numbers, but uh, not just the receiving, but also like the punt return stuff has been I'm glad awesome. You brought that up Almost won in the game against Tennessee, really. Like it, yeah. he's been great in multiple spots. So really good finds by them. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the D, the DK and the, and the punt return because I remember right before the season started, I was hearing rumors that he was going to be on punt return, and I okay, I'll, I'll let me put a, let me put it out on Twitter and see what the Gator Nation thinks. Ah, oh, he's too slow. He don't need to be back there. Well. uh Coaching staff was right about that one. <laughs> yeah, good call. But anything else? Uh, yeah, those were huge you, ads. Seth and I talked. Yeah. Yes, Seth and I talked a lot about it heading into the year that you know we were going to have a pretty good receiving core. You know, these guys on paper, you know, especially you know DK's twenty twenty two numbers were pretty elite. Um, these were good weapons and, and good gets from the portal, which I love getting receivers from the portal. Um, and they, they really gave us some of the best returning production that we have in, in a wide receiver room in, you know, almost half a decade. So, you know, can't can't undersell how important these guys have been this year. For sure. Um, guys, we've been, we've been pretty positive so far. Uh, and, I, you know, I, I don't want to go uh, to, to, too negative here as we, you know, get a little bit, feeling better uh, about themselves right now. But, wait, hey, we're going to break it down uh, even further right here. And where Gary, and where the offense has broken down the last couple of games is in the red zone. So, is it is is it a personnel thing? Is it play calling? What what, what are both of you guys seeing, and what Florida's struggles are in, in the red zone right now? Thankfully, they've been able to to score on the explosives, but cost them in the Tennessee game in, in, in a lot of ways. You kind of thought, oh no, here we go again, because that's what we were getting at the beginning of the Kentucky game as well. And that would probably be the biggest issue, I think, uh, or one of the biggest issues we see on the offense right now is just uh, when they get to the red zone, a little bit of a little bit of bog down. Yeah, I think um, the touchdown percentage has been okay. I think it's around seventy percent in conference play, um, and most coaches are shooting for like a seventy-five percent number. That's a lot of the kind of goals, but um, there's definitely feels like there's a lot more that they've left out there. I think some of it was bad. The, the fumble on the quarterback sneak, yeah. that's, to me, that's more bad luck. Um, but they they have had chances to kind of uh, be a little bit more creative. And this is where, like, I think my biggest um, gripe with Billy is just he's not super creative. And that's just not – I don't think that's who he is. I think he has creativity in some smart parts, but – um, the quick passing game is not super, that's not super creative. And there's some ways I think you could use some of your guys, especially with all the motion you do. There's ways to kind of pop guys open down here in the red zone. Um, it's maybe doesn't, it's not as bad as it feels. I think the numbers, especially in conference are decent, but, yeah. um, you know, down there, it becomes a lot more like match because it's a lot more man coverage. It's a lot more, you know, there's fields compressed. So it's a lot more about, uh, I think quarterback's really important down there in terms of yeah. guys like impl- timing and and getting it on people quickly. Uh, so I'll be interested to see if, you know, as the season goes, Lagway is able to kind of fit the ball in some tight windows. And it's about guys getting separation quickly. Some of that can be done schematically with motion and things like that. Uh, so, you know, you'd like to see some of that done as well. But I think it's just space gets compressed. You got to match up. You haven't won some of those matchups. But There's I do wonder, in. yeah. But I do wonder if we see Lagway's legs um, a, a bit more in that situation too. I think so. I think we saw, honestly, probably one of the only times that I, I think we ran. One of the times we got in the red zone against Kentucky, we ran uh, like two zone reads right in right in a row. You know, that's the only time where it's like really that's like that's what we got here. And second yeah. is second and third down. And it's like, uh, I kind of wish we had something, some wrinkle, wrinkle here. Um, you know, I get he's a weapon, but I was really expecting a little bit more. I forget, if, maybe a second drive. Um, but, yeah, that, w- that was probably the only time I was really frustrated. There was definitely some bad luck. I mean, even 
the one that got tipped, you know, lagway rolling out. He had Badger in the end zone, um, got tipped on third down. That one, I think first one. Um, so, you know, there's some stuff where it's just luck. And then there's some stuff where it's like, got to be, like Seth said, a little bit more creative. Um, but ultimately a lot of it, the real frustration is procedural. You know, it seems mm. like we're slow getting play calls in when we get down there. Um, we're making some interesting decisions with, you know, kick and field goals versus going for it sometimes. Um, and then just bad luck too. I mean, those are huge expected point swings. If you have a fumble down there where, you know, you're supposed to get six or you throw a pick, things like that really matter a lot down there. Um, but they tend to revert to the mean overall, so we'll see. Yeah, I'm looking at Jade Ball too, just because of his the shiftiness he has shown. Um, why you know, yeah, it is compressed, but he's proven that he can make some guys miss. So it may not even be the perfect blocking or whatever, but he's gonna he's, he's gonna make a play to maybe uh, I think can you know, help Florida in the red zone, and we've seen a little bit of that too. Uh, but and we'll go back to you, too, because this is worth mentioning, uh, because you mentioned uh, in the private chat we were having there on Twitter, the story of the game for you coming out of Kentucky were the trenches. And look, that probably should be the storyline, because that's where Florida has just been owned against Kentucky well, since Kentucky has just started, you know, uh, being more competitive against Florida, getting wins over Florida. It's really started in the trenches on both sides of the ball. You said that was probably your biggest takeaway. I think so. Um, that's the biggest surprise. I mean, you can watch the first play of the game and, you know, ball's not getting touched at least four yards down the field. Um, and then I think some of that is lagway. It's a lagway effect. You can watch, you know, defensive end. They were playing it really aggressively, um, but he was holding them sometimes. It's also a good scheme. You know, we have that slide motion where the tight end comes – cross behind the formation and we'll hit them for passes and Kentucky was playing the pass there. So they were essentially that was taking a linebacker out of the box every time. Um, and then ball played really well. O line got a great push and ball was finding really good. You know, he was hitting small holes. Those, those were not always gaping holes. You know, even though O line was getting a good push, you know, he still had to, to hit the seam and he did a really good job at that. And then make one guy miss and and pick up uh you know pick up some big chunk yardage. That was a that was a really impressive run game from Florida offense. I thought we'd see Seth and I talked on our preview, Kentucky was bad versus the gap runs. You know, we thought Florida might, you know, try that, even though we weren't a good gap run team. And we had some of those hit. Situationally, we thought we did really good with calling the zone read. I think the we tested one out for that drive we started back near our uh our own end zone. So that's when we started pulling out the zone read. So low leverage situation just to see how Kentucky is going to play it. Um, and they were playing it really aggressive. They're coming down, essentially hitting the running back. They wanted to make DJ keep it. And then didn't call it again until a third and one, you know, just on the other side of the 50 and yeah. went for a big game, got the first down. I thought that was really good situational play calling and, um, I think we'll see a little bit more of that. We'll probably see a few more wrinkles to it. But uh, there was a pop pass element to it as well, or a RPO, a little bubble screen off of it as well. So we'll probably throw throw that at some point. Um, yeah, it's a good game. Uh, and Seth, before you, before you hop in there and I can't go into the trenches, I think really probably, probably some of the best guard play we've seen so far this year, and I don't know if it's because of the quarterback change and how much he helps, and and, and but Damian George, who has been much maligned, has certainly probably, probably played one of his better games. Uh, Cam Wakes is getting time at left guard now, uh, and we're seeing him go along with Najee Harris to form a pretty good one-two punch at the left guard spot. So uh, I, I like some of the personnel that we're seeing there, too, of guys really improving as the season comes along. Yeah, and George probably had like the block of the week or maybe one of the yeah. blocks of the season on that pool. So, uh, yeah, they're doing some uh, – they, they obviously had played really well against Kentucky, opened up some holes for Jaden Ball. And I, I think, like Bud said, the quarterback run element, this was one of our big questions going into the game because you look back at the Richardson year and there was always the question of why aren't they running him more 
versus why is he not pulling these balls? Like, is, is it is it him or is it the staff not calling it because he's got no backup really? So we were kind of one kind of took a wait and see how much were they going to run Lagway or be willing to run him, and they did it a little bit more than we thought they would, and that just just the threat of it helps the run game so much because you're holding people on the backside. Um, you know, after AR left, it was kind of, or will I be able to do with RPO? And they really weren't because people didn't really respect it too much. And just you, when you're able to take some extra bodies off the backside of runs, especially when you're running stretch and things like that, you can really widen it up and now give your back a nice seam to get vertical in. And I, I think it's really, it's funny. Just like, it's not just the change of quarterback, but just having that threat there run can really kind of help make things go a little bit smoother in the run game. And once things go smooth in the run game, it makes the passing game easier. This, that's kind of how this offense is built. So yeah, um, it, it was, I think that just little, little bit of willingness to run the quarterback helps uh, immensely. Good stuff. Good stuff. Guys. Hey, let's switch to the other side of the ball before we uh, go here and, a hot topic uh, since that first bye week, and it's been the improvement of that side of the ball. And, Bud, you brought it up, too, the personnel. Um, we, we've, we, we have a good indication now that the players who need to be on the field more and the situation that they're in. I mean, Sapp, Pyburn, Searcy, Gums, Jackson, Banks, Watson up front, Shamar, Pup, Robinson at linebacker, uh, Marshall until the injury. Uh, Devin Moore, Bridges, Castell, Denson, Gates. I mean, those guys, that seems to be your core. Uh, some guy, it goes too deep with, with some of those guys there. And look, we're seeing an obvious passing situations, a pass rush package now that I don't think we saw much before the bye week. I mean, you're seeing a pass rush package of Boone, Cam James, Searcy, Gums, all on the field together. If it's third and passing, those guys are out there up front. And I, I, I love seeing that when we first saw it to me. Uh, against UCF uh, in that in that package that they were uh, breaking it out. So that side of the ball has done a nice job of settling down and, and playing the guys that really perform. I think so. And, you know, Bridges had a great game. Gates had a yeah. great game. He's played well. Dijon is playing really good. You're having a lot of guys step up. Um, I think going into the year, there were a lot of dudes that had some playing time that I was feeling okay about but I didn't know who, who were going to be the guys. And we're starting to see, oh, yeah, this is a good one. This is the DB snap counts by game. Um, and really the green are the three guys I just mentioned who we've seen a lot of good snap count increase. And their PFF grades are on the right. Green is good. And their yards per coverage snap are on the right. And green is good. And you got to kind of grade safeties and cornerbacks on a curve here. Your safeties are usually going to have higher yards per snap than the um, – than the cornerbacks. So, but, but still we're seeing good play from those guys and they're seeing a lot more of the field. Some of that's injury. Um, but you know, you've seen guys like Turner get out to Jackson. Now Marshall Marshall is having a great year. I, I really hate that for him. So mm-hmm. um, all the best to him and hope he heals up, but you know, Denson's played well. Um, you know, I think you've got, you know, Devin Moore, he's played pretty good too. Um, just, it's been it's been good to see a lot of dudes on the field, um, and them kind of find the rotation and have some depth there. Because there were years, I mean, last year it felt like you only had two safeties, and they were young and they were getting beat up and they were getting taken advantage of, and you didn't have a chance to really rotate them off, um, and, and or have guys you know rest and recover and, and come out and play really well, or or have a backup that you felt good that you might be able to sub in for them. So it's been good to see they've. Um, They've done especially good. I think we've learned Miami's really good. Um, and, you know, we we played well against Tennessee and Kentucky and UCF. Um, none of those are great passing offenses, um, especially right now. But I think the big thing is the run defense has played exceptionally well. Um, Caleb Blanks has played well. Pop Howard is just having a year. Uh, what oh a great ad. Um <laughs> Yeah, just making tackles, not missing tackles. Yeah, he's a Jacksonville guy, right? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and here's so. the thing. When's the last time we've been able to say Florida's got good nickel play and good linebacker play? It's been 
forever. Yeah. I mean, you might have one or the other. I mean, do I mean, it's probably been forever since we've been able to say both at the same time. But even just one. I mean, you know, Shamar has been okay the last couple of years. We're still waiting on him to take that jump this year, uh, and he has along. And it, I think what's helped him the most is he's got some help beside him. He don't have to make up for the other linebacker beside him. Pup Howard's making plays. Jaden Robinson since the bye week, and a player that we pointed out during the bye week, he needs more snaps, and he's getting more snaps, and he's proven that, hey, yeah, give me the more snaps, and, and, and I'll go perform for you. Uh, but that nickel and, and the linebacker, you know, finally it's a good combo there for Florida. That they, 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 good, they have a good second level finally. I mean, you go back and watch the Tennessee game. This is something we highlighted kind of in our review of the game. You've got like Denson and Gates coming in and stuffing tackles that are pulling. It's like that's hard to teach. You've got to recruit that. And they've they've recruited it. And those it's a really it's it's unfortunate some of the 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 stuff swirling around the program because of how many young guys you see are playing really well. And so uh you say, oh, you know, these guys are going to get better. They're going to be, they're developing, they're getting better. Um, Gates is a guy that's like, it, it, you know, feels like he can make himself a lot of money here if he can cover people because he's so physical and avoids blocks really well. I mean, he's making plays seemingly all over the field. Uh, so he, he seems like he was a definite hit. Um, I mentioned Denson, same thing, like coming up and stuffing a tackle, pulling for Tennessee and, and then coming off and like, turning the play back inside in the run game. I mean, there's been some really, really good stuff. They're playing a lot more to safety stuff, it seems like, which is more of what Roberts did at Auburn. So maybe the rules are a little bit more clear for those guys. They can be more attacking. You know, if, in a too high look, maybe if I'm the safety, I can – if I read run, I can really get downhill and fit it instead of maybe if I'm the one high safety, it, it changes some things for me. It makes it a little bit more difficult. So maybe there's some confusion there. Uh, with them running so much one high last year, and they started the season running a ton of it. This year, it seems like they've moved a little bit more to the two high stuff, and maybe that's easier for those guys. But I, I think Bridges playing more has been really helpful. Uh, he looked great until you know, and then had the butt targeting or whatever it was against like Texas <laughs> A&M. Uh, but he's been great, kind of every time he's gotten a chance to play. Uh, veteran guy, really aggressive. So. Um, Interesting to see if Asa Turner ever gets back. If yeah. uh, you know uh, having him in the mix, I think should only help. So um, the defense uh, failed the first big test pretty dramatically, and then on the national TV. But uh, they've gotten a lot better since that bye week. So that's something to kind of hang your hat on, and and hopefully that can maybe they figured some things out and and simplified it so they can go play a little faster. Yeah, pressuring the quarterback probably. I still still think the aspect we probably struggled the most with, with, with this defense, um, and and it's hard to measure right now. I, I've absolutely. I think we all three will say. I don't want to speak for you, but they are a better group since that bye week. They they are a better defense. They have faced some very one dimensional offenses. So I think we'll get, we'll get some true tests coming up. Two things can be true at the same time. They are better. They still have a lot to prove. Uh, and I, look, that goes for the whole team overall. But I think specifically for this defense, because you played run heavy UCF, run heavy Tennessee, you run heavy uh, uh, Kentucky. Now you'll balanced offense with Georgia, balanced offense with Texas. So there's more balanced offenses are coming up to get more true test of how and just how much improved this defense is. Yeah, you'll find out quick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm a little worried, like you said, about the pass rush. That's concerning. We're below average at pressure rate. We're below average at sack rate. You know, Gumps has been pretty good, um, but we really have not found that many great guys getting to the QB consistently. And it's something that we got to be a little bit concerned on as we come up against these, these teams that are a little – oh, yeah, here we go. Here's some pass rush numbers. Gums doing great. Um, Piper, so the rush percent is pretty interesting. This is kind of telling a little bit who's kind of playing that Jack linebacker, um, where they like to drop them into coverage and it's been Pyburn mainly Searcy's played it pretty well. Um, uh, but you see gums doing it too. And this is kind of, you know, Princely didn't like doing that. So I think that's why he's at old miss, but pressure rate for gums was pretty good. A little bit lower for Pyburn and Searcy. Caleb banks on, you know, 8% pressure rate out of a D tackle. That's pretty solid. Um, that's that that's a that's an eye opening one right there. Um, you know, but you know, young guys like McRae, true freshman, you know, pressuring at twelve percent. 
probably worth seeing a, a few more snaps out of him. Um, Sap and Boone doing pretty good as well, but it's it's kind of something that we've seen a little bit that we've struggled to consistently generate pressure with this defense. Um, and I think there, we're going to play some offenses that if you give the QB a lot of time, you're going to see this good pass defense get picked apart a little bit. Um, but at the same time, we've played really well. We're learning a lot. I, I think the change has been good. You know, we still, we're still playing the middle of the field close stuff. We're still playing cover three. We're a multiple defense. We're going to play a lot of different stuff. So when Seth and I say we're playing more too high, we're talking percentages. We're just yeah. a few, you know, percent more snaps um, a game. A lot of that's dictated by the offense we're playing. But I think the shift yeah. to Ron Roberts in the booth has been good. That seems like it's paid off. Um you know, they've apparently changed how they practice a little bit. That seems to be showing improvement. And then, you know, I heard that they kind of changed how they're doing the helmet comms as well. And, you know, Florida didn't get a bowl game. So it was kind of understandable. There might be some learning curves there. So I think it's reasonable to expect those things to have made improvement and for Florida be, to be playing a little bit better. All right, guys, uh, we'll end this. We kind of previewed it there because talking about the defense and what is ahead, more balanced offenses uh, against those guys. But, hey, Florida's got some tough defenses coming up as well. A uh, really good true test for D.J. Lagway with Georgia and Texas, uh, two of the top teams in the country, of course. So, by week and then the November stretch we've discussed for it seems like a year now <laughs> ever since the schedule got released. So um, what are you looking forward to the most uh, with this November stretch? You know, do, do you feel better going into it uh, we, 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 where Florida's at? Um, I think you are more hopeful because of what you've seen now for, for, for Florida, but know that, uh, uh, like I said, just for the defense, just overall as a team, there are some good feelings. Florida is a better team but still, still a lot to prove. Yeah, my, my thought going into the season was I thought the team would be improved, uh, but the record probably wouldn't show it. And that was kind of the tough part of it with the schedule. Um, it doesn't seem to me, now that we're here, there was some talk that, well, the schedule's a lot easier. The first half, maybe there's a few couple of games that were a little bit easier at the time than you thought in the preseason, but. Uh, no, no, my, uh, Miami but, and Texas A&M might be better than what we thought. Yeah. So. <laughs> so, Tennessee kind of downgrade, Kentucky downgrade, yeah. uh, Miami uh, much better. Yeah, Texas A&M probably a little bit better. Uh, but uh, other than Florida State on this back half, everybody's just as good or better, I think, than people thought they would be. So, Ole Miss um, maybe not. We'll see. Yeah, they're they're kind of on the borderline, but they. Yeah. I mean, they're them and LSU. You know that nip and talk kind of overtime game was kind of. Yeah, it evens out, I guess. Uh, so I think the fun part is, especially with all the young guys playing young quarterback, you know, can you, you know, rise up and beat one of these teams? Uh, I can't remember. Like Chris Leak's freshman year, go on the road to LSU, mm. kind of pull one out, yeah. uh, hitting theatric phasing down the down the yeah. scene. Uh, you know, can you get one of those kind of games? Or, and, or, you know, an old man like me still remembers it uh, in, in a few years. So, like, that, those are the things you look for. Can you can you, can you, you pull one out and then beat Florida State? And then uh, if you do that, kind of see where you're at at the end of the year. But um, the opportunity, if you feel like you're playing better, the Tennessee, a ten, again, winning against Tennessee would have been mm. very nice. But uh, it seems like you're on the right track. So, if you can go and, and steal one or two, uh, I think that's asking a lot, but steal one and then beat Florida State. You know, uh, maybe you're feeling pretty good at the end of the year. I don't know, but uh, it's, it's still going to be a very, 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 very tough stretch. I think it'll be tough. Um, personally, I think Ole Miss and Texas are the two toughest ones left. You know, Ole Miss has two losses, but you look at their advanced stats, that's a great team good on both sides of the ball. I think they've been leading like something ridiculous, like 14. They're, they've only been trailing 14 minutes cumulatively on the, on the entire year. Um, and they've just dominated most of these games. They've managed to squander two of them away. Despite, you know, you'll go look at the post game win expectancy and uh, they should have won both of those, but um, they managed to lose them. Kind of like 2020 Florida, you know, sometimes you're just snake bit and you lose games. Um, but 
I think those are two really tough ones. I think I'm really curious about how Jacksonville is going to look. Um, yeah. I think this is the most well-rounded Florida offense we've taken at Jacks in, in years. Um, it's definitely the best of line. And, you know, you go look how Kirby played us in 2022 and he just, his safeties are forever away. They were saying, you're not going to beat us with a deep ball. You're going to have to dink and dunk it and run AR. AR is a little banged up. Couldn't do it. Couldn't get the run game going. Our O-line was getting worked. Um, that was a brutal one. I think this year we're going to take in three good wide receivers, a really good tight end, a pretty good run game, a much better O-line, and a QB who's willing to take the shots. And this is going to be one of the first times I think we see Kirby really have to prepare for a multidimensional UF offense. So I'm excited just to see – that matchup, I think it's going to be good, um, or at least interesting. There will be things that are interesting about it. Uh, I think we can beat LSU. Um, I like them or catching them post Bama at home, and that's a good one. Ole Miss is tough. We're catching them off a of bye. Texas is tough because we're going to be at Texas. But, yeah, they're they're, they're coming. The odds of too. those four games cumulatively is we should win one of them. Yeah, and, and that's. That's hard. Um, and then we should just absolutely destroy FSU. I want to see <laughs> as many points as we can put up. Um, and, yeah, let's have it, you know, Billy Napier Stadium at Ron Zook Field, something like that. Yeah, we're going to get a, a Ron Zook redo here. <laughs> hey, they, they are remodeling the stadium, so why not? Just go, ahead, just, go ahead, just go ahead and put the stuff up. There you go. <laughs> hey, guys, thanks uh, one more time. Gators game day. Check them out uh, during the week. Um, during during game weeks, as they said, uh, preview, halftime, postgame, all that good stuff. Seth, J-Bud, I uh, can't thank you enough. Yeah. Also, thanks for being in that Gators Breakdown Plus Discord. Guys, if you want to have some more conversation with those guys, you can be a part of that. But one more time, thank you so much for being right here on Gators Breakdown. Thanks for having us on, Dave. All right, everybody go there. Subscribe. Thanks, Gators Dave. Game Day on yeah, Gators Game Day on YouTube. Go subscribe to them. Uh, really good stuff. Thanks for uh hopping on here. We'll get his breakdown for us. Uh bye week, and we'll be back next week previewing big game, Florida, Georgia. See you guys later.